Okay. Um, I think we have a fairly good quorum of uh, attendees. Um, let me just look through the list to see if there's anybody who's not present that I think would be um, really vital. I am going to record this and share it anyway. So um, I see that uh, Ian is here. Welcome, Ian. Um, I don't see um, anybody else from the community except one person who dialed in by phone. Um, so I think we only have light community uh, representation, but um, I'm hoping that uh, people who are here will interface with people in the community and, and share um, what we talk about. Of course, there will be a written um, uh, hype that goes along with this uh, discussion that everybody uh, can look at. And the slide deck for this presentation um, can also be shared. The link to it is uh, the thing that I'm showing right here. And um, for the next little while, I'm going to make it so that um, this slide deck can be edited by anybody in the world. And there's a reason why. Um, and that is uh, that I want to accumulate questions um, in the speaker notes for this slide deck. Um, I, the way that I want to present this, there's, I think, 40, how many slides? Oh, 50 slides. So if you can think about the challenge of getting through 50 slides in 90 minutes, you'll realize that I'm a little bit worried about um, how, how much we can present. Um, so I'm going to try to present with only light uh, Q&A for about 60 minutes. It might take longer, but we'll do our best. And um, while we're presenting, if you have questions that are kind of substantive questions, if you could actually open the speaker notes to the slide deck, and again, here's the URL for that. If you could open the speaker notes and type your questions in the actual slide where they apply, um, then we will have a written record of anything that people are uh, wondering about or concerned about, and I can respond to your questions um, in written form, even if we don't have time to uh, cover them during the meeting. So, um, hey, Daniel, I'll make yeah. sure to, uh, once the recording is done, to share it in any notes and the deck uh, with both Rocket Chat and in the indie mailing list. And uh, I'll get the video over to Tracy in case they want to present it to you. Excellent. Thank you, Sean. Okay. So, um, what we're going to do if we have time for Q&A, I hope we do at the end, is we will circle back and look through the speaker notes and try to cover um, as much uh, of the uh, question stuff as we can live in the meeting. So um, a little bit more context before I start the main presentation here. Um, the uh, topic of wallets is a very deep topic and a very rich one. and um, we have been thinking hard about wallets for well over a year now, and um, I think the implementation of wallets that um, Indie SDK has is quite a nice one already. But I feel like over the last six months, we have learned some important things about wallets, and uh, I feel a need to describe the theory and the uh, implementation approach um, at a high level um, in a formal way. Um, and so there will be a hype raised against uh, Indy. There actually is already um, a significant body of work that is accumulating in a fork of the Indy hype repo in preparation for me to raise this pull request, but um, I have a few details to tie up before I actually raise the pull request. So um, what I'm presenting here is basically an overview of a, a large body of written documentation that I'm about to um, propose gets committed to um, the Indie project. Okay, with that as context, let me dive in. Um, 
first of all, I'd like to talk about the mental model that we have when we um, think about wallets. Um, and some of this material um, may have already been seen by people on this call, but I think there's new material here for everybody. Um, and uh, yet I'll try to cover things that I think are uncontroversial um, or require less comment as quickly as I can. So I think we all understand, uh, let me go into present mode here. Um, I think we all understand the basic metaphor of a wallet. Um, and you can read what I said about a wallet there, but this is the basis for um, the way we've been talking about digital wallets. And I think it applies pretty well, but like all metaphors, um, it's a little bit imperfect. Um, I would like to propose that generally speaking, when we talk about wallets in the context of indie, that we understand there's an adjective in front of the word wallet. We don't always have to say it, but an identity wallet is not quite the same as some of the other kinds of wallets that are out there. I'll talk a little bit more about that. But you'll see that it does more or less match the metaphor. Um, there's a few things to note here. Uh, this middle paragraph talks about the fact that wallet has to implement some things to keep people safe and private. Um, the notion that a wallet has a location turns out to be interesting for several reasons that I'll bring up later. And um, the notion that a wallet is a unit of portability and that that's part of its purpose also um, colors its, its design a little bit. Um, okay, so just to be clear, our wallet, an identity wallet, is quite similar but not identical to a cryptocurrency wallet. And the, my bullets there kind of highlight some subtle differences. Um, in and I, you notice the the size of the two icons here. Cryptocurrency wallets generally don't hold millions of things, um, but it's pretty clear that identity wallets are going to have to have a greater capacity, at least for some kinds of users. And um, there's also, because of the uh, needs of self-sovereign identity, there are some different standards for how data in a wallet, an identity wallet, could be managed relative to data in a cryptocurrency wallet. So I have had a number of discussions over the past um, year with people who have started from the position, well, couldn't we just use a cryptocurrency wallet? And that's an intelligent question. And we absolutely should learn from cryptocurrency wallets. And we could possibly implement an identity wallet um, by taking a cryptocurrency wallet and enhancing it. But I don't want anybody to think that an cryptocurrency wallet will just work it out of the box um, for all of the use cases that identity wallets have. Um, another construct that we need to keep firmly in mind is that you can have an identity owner and in shorthand sometimes when we speak we say Alice's wallet or something and of course Alice does have a wallet but what we're simplifying over there is that Alice may actually have multiple wallets. And for her, it should feel like she has one wallet most of the time. She shouldn't have to think about that subtlety. So I'm not saying that from a UX perspective, we need to really promote that difference. But we need to be clear technically underneath that Alice has multiple wallets, one associated with each agent uh, that is part of her universe. And um, there's some subtleties around that that will show up later in the design too. Lastly, uh, in terms of kind of, you know, tweaking of mental models, um, I'd like to suggest that there's a concept of a vault as well. And I'm using the term vault to mean all the stuff that Alice is safekeeping inside of her own uh, sovereign domain. And, um, that could be a lot of stuff and not all of it is wallet stuff. Um, you'll notice in the little icons uh, uh, set that I've got here that, you know, Flickr would be digital photos, Dropbox could be any old thing. Um, so all of it you could call a vault. And um, this 
presentation is not about vaults, but I'm just highlighting that this concept that I'm calling a vault on this slide is not the same thing as a wallet, although it has certain characteristics that overlap and that we need to understand later. So um, let me talk a little bit about who uses wallets and how they use wallets. Um, I propose that there are three basic kinds of users of wallets. Um, and the first one is represented by the Alice persona. Alice is an individual identity owner, and uh, you can see my simplified sovereign domain diagram for her down there, where she has some stuff in clouds. She might own some Internet of Things things. Uh, she might have some devices that she uses. And uh, you can see my guesses about um, what kind of data accumulates for Alice. She may have a couple hundred credentials, three different types of, types of cryptocurrency. Uh, what kind of stuff does she do with credentials? Well, she just uses them. Now, um, there are certainly individual users that don't fit the Alice prototype. Uh, there are people that have more than a couple hundred credentials, and in a few years in the sovereign ecosystem, it may be common for all individual users to have thousands of credentials, um, and that's fine. It won't do violence to um, the rest of the design to still think about Alice as being an important persona. Um, and then there is an institutional identity owner, and I'm using Faber College for that. And you can see a little bit about what uh, Faber College's usage patterns uh, in the ecosystem might be. They are an issuer of credentials. They're also a verifier of uh, proofs. Um, and then um, the third kind of um, uh, persona is something that we have learned from the contributions of uh, the um, BC Gov folks in the community, um, which is the notion of a trust hub. This is some kind of uh, institution usually, I guess it could theoretically be a person, but anyway, some uh, collector of credentials and dispenser of credentials um, uh, you could think of it almost like a credential library um, uh, construct. And um, the one that uh, exists in the org book um, is a great example of this trust hub. But since we've been introduced to the org book, we've seen some other cases for this same kind of construct. So we think this is an important uh, persona uh, or user of wallets in the ecosystem as well. Um, okay. We could list use cases for many hours. There are, you know, so many different ways that wallets could be used, but if you step, step back from all of them and kind of squint a little bit, they all basically fit into the following mold. So this isn't really a use case, but more of a meta use case, but basic or a summary of meta use cases pretty much all the stuff that people do with wallets um, boils down to this uh, list here in the middle of the screen create an identity set up protective policies around your identity govern your agents connect and interact with others recover and revoke stuff and take your identity somewhere else um, so um, the connect and interact um, thing in the middle there is particularly uh, a, a simplification. There's so many different kinds of interactions. And um, as we'll see a little bit later on, um, one kind of interaction that, or, or one kind of feature that shows up in many, many interactions is the ability to search your wallet and find important information relevant to the context. Um, which has colored some of um, our design work uh, recently. Okay, so now I'd like to talk a little bit about the data that goes in wallets. This is an area where I feel like I have learned several important things in the recent past. Um, so originally when we started building wallets, we had a very simple idea about what went in wallets. We figured that basically the only thing that ever went in wallets was cryptographic material, namely keys. And we imagined that wallets would be very small and portable. 
And I think that was a great place to start. It was the right place to start. Um, but what we've learned here is that um, wallets have to provide a little bit more help in proving. Now, um, when we first understood how the org book worked, and we realized that there could be a wallet that had 10 million credentials in it, um, we quickly understood that the simplistic algorithm that we were using inside of a wallet uh, when you wanted to prove something to find the right credentials was not going to work. And um, the fact is we would have found that architectural pressure uh, eventually anyway, even if we'd never learned that there was such a thing as an org book because individuals uh, could, as I said in the future, maybe accumulate tens of thousands of credentials if every receipt that they get when they go purchase something becomes a credential and you know every kind of digital interaction generates credentials. You could end up with many thousands of things that you have to search for when you're trying to prove a particular thing. Um, so the need to be able to uh, prove things in an efficient way using your wallet as the basis of uh, persisted knowledge um, has taught us that wallets probably have to have a strong relationship to your credentials and that it has to be possible to um, filter those credentials and find them efficiently and with very powerful selectors. Um, and um, an even more recent learning that I've had is uh, that wallets probably have an important role to play in regulatory compliance. Um, uh, the General uh, Policy Council for Evernim, Elizabeth Reneris, just wrote a wonderful series of blog posts about uh, how self-sovereign identity is the answer to privacy and data control regulations such as GDPR, uh, very insightful. And one of the things that I got out of that is that uh, there are certain legal requirements that um, identity owners are going to have to meet in our ecosystem and that the wallet is a natural place to address some of those. So for example, if you give consent um, to certain people, or if you receive consent from certain people, you need to be able to track that and report it later. And you need to keep track of what data has been shared with certain people. These may be things that fit into wallets um, pretty nicely. And so we need to think about that in our design work. And last bullet item I'm putting here, I've basically learned that my original simple idea wasn't flexible enough um, and that we probably need to plan to be a little bit flexible because we may learn some additional things as this ecosystem matures. So I'm backing off of the really crisp um, formulation that only keys go in wallets, but I am going to continue to offer some guidelines about what is appropriate for wallets because I don't think every piece of data is appropriate for wallets. And you'll see some content about that going forward in the slide deck. So um, this slide, many of you have seen before, it's just an acknowledgement that um, data um, that relates to a user um, could be pretty different. It could be different on a data richness dimension um, it could be different on a size dimension. And um, the cryptographic keys that I originally imagined in the wallet, you can see fit way down in the, you know, near the origin on both dimensions here. But then you have stuff all the way up to a genome, which is still highly personal data, still probably tied to your identity pretty strongly in some ways. And yet it's enormous and it's super rich. So um, I'm, this is just an acknowledgement of the complexity of the data management problem that um, attaches to self-sovereign identity. Um, and then I think you've also seen this slide, at least many of you have before. This is an acknowledgement that not all data is equally sensitive or equally risky. Um, and so I've drawn a continuum here and at the left side you have data that is red meaning 
um, you know, if you lose this data, your entire digital existence is at risk across all relationships and all time. And then I've drawn a yellow position on the continuum, which I'm calling the semi-sensitive place where losing this particular kind of data would cause a temporary annoyance or it might, you know, leak more info about you than you want, but not in a catastrophic way or something like that. And I've tried to indicate a few different types of data and where they might roughly fall on this continuum. There's things off the right side of this continuum as well. I'm not even bothering to draw those, but you know, um, uh, a record that you, um, you know, once showed up at a rock concert is probably not um, super private and is probably not anywhere on the sensitivity spectrum that I'm even showing here. But you'll see that even within the um, set of materials that we consider part of your self-sovereign identity, there's an interesting range here. Your link secret or your cryptocurrency keys are pretty far over to the left compared to DIDs, for example, or credentials themselves. Credentials, although people could um, learn things about us if they see our credentials, um, probably wouldn't allow somebody to impersonate us just because they possess a credential. And so um, it's not nearly as dangerous to lose a digital driver's license as it is to lose a bunch of keys that allow you to prove ownership of something. Okay, um, so this kind of leads to an observation. Uh, uh, I wanted to kind of enumerate things that we know for sure going uh an indie wallet, and you'll see before you even read the list carefully, it's a long list. It's it's bigger than just encryption and signing keys, which is the first thing on the on the list. Um, and it's gotten longer as time has gone by. Um, and you'll see some things where I've got questions. I don't think um, all um, answers to this question of what should go in a wallet have. Are, are strongly known. We have, we're starting to have opinions about some of them, uh, but also discovering new questions. So I think the main takeaway I'd like to leave you with on this slide is just that um, a lot of stuff could potentially go in a wallet and it, they, they're interesting and different. Um, not all things that, that go there are identical, but they do have certain characteristics in common. Now, um, let me also point out a, a particular characteristic of certain kinds of data. The, this is data that fits way over to the left um, on this risk profile uh, spectrum, okay? Um, there's a picture here uh, of some uh, medical researchers handling Ebola. And um, just like, you know, we, we all, I hope, have a, a rough idea that you don't just casually leave Ebola laying around on the counter. Um, secrets that certain kinds of secrets in our world um, need special handling like that, where you don't ever take them out of a protected environment. So this has been a design characteristic of indie wallets uh, since the beginning that we recognize the special nature of secrets and we create them inside the wallet to begin with and we never take them out of that safe place. We may pass a handle to that secret, for example, a public key that's, the, that's half of a, a key pair. We might pass the public key across an API boundary and let uh, a consumer of a wallet see the public key but we're never going to give a private key across that boundary. It needs to stay in its safe place. This is the way that uh, TPMs and HSMs work as well. And so we're in good company by designing wallets to handle secrets that way. Um, so this leads to the following idea for wallet composition. And this slide is new. I don't think anybody's seen this before. Um, six months ago, the way we uh, did wallets did not match this diagram, but this hype is going to propose and uh, engineers have been, uh, you know, urgently coding towards um, encapsulating um, wallet functionality as shown here in this diagram. Specifically, there is a, a, a core of a wallet 
uh, implemented in Indy that will be common to all wallets in the ecosystem. And this core includes all of the logic that understands encryption, that understands how to query uh, things that are stored inside wallets, and it understands which kinds of things in wallets um, need special handling as secrets versus which kinds of things don't need special handling. And that particular um, uh, core of a wallet then is completed by plugging in some kind of pluggable storage. And there's some slides a little bit later on where we'll talk about how the pluggable storage works. But basically, you, you combine the pluggable storage with the core of a wallet and you get a complete wallet. And um, the storage uh, could be a number of different things. It could be a traditional um, uh, file system that just has some kind of, you know, organization that lets you find things in the file system. It could be a relational database. It could be a NoSQL database or a graph database or all other kinds of things. Um, there are certain characteristics that it's going to have to, or certain attributes it's going to have to provide. But um, we don't care exactly what the storage is. And the, the encryption is not done by the storage. The encryption is done by the core, and as a result, all wallets in the Indy ecosystem have um, a strong encryption profile. Um, even if you're doing, you're storing the data in some, um, let's say that you're, I'll take a ridiculous case, you're storing all of the data for your wallet on a Dropbox folder that um, is readable by the entire world. Um, the encryption is something that is done before data streams into your Dropbox and after it streams out of the Dropbox. But when it's in that publicly visible place, it's always encrypted very, very strongly in such a fashion that the, the strength or weakness of your storage has very little effect on the overall security of your data. And so this unburdens um, storage. All that storage has to do is be good at storing stuff and retrieving it. It doesn't have to be good at encrypting stuff. And I think that's a very good characteristic. It also means that um, you know, if we do pen testing, we can do pen testing against um, the general wallet interface uh, the wallet core, and it doesn't really matter whether the backing storage is SQLite or a file system or whatever, it's going to have approximately the same security characteristics. So I think that's a huge improvement in our um, modeling of wallets. I'm very uh, happy about that. So the secrets interface all of the see every time you're dealing with something that's a secret, you're going to see some kind of a function in libindy that says something like create and store whatever the kind of secret is. And um, what that means is create inside your uh, storage uh, the following secret already encrypted, uh, and then don't give me back the actual secret that you just created, but give me back some kind of a handle, like a public key or a name for this thing, a DID. Um, and so an example of these kinds of functions, there's a function called indie create and store my DID, and then indie key for DID that will uh, look up things. But the key that you get back with indie key for DID is the public key, not the private key. So all things that are secret related in uh, wallets follow the same general pattern. Um, and in order to enhance security further, we have a few rules that we follow. Um, LibIndy itself only holds true secrets in plain text for an instant, after which it calls a secure memory erase function to make sure it's gone. Um, so snooping on the RAM that LibIndy is using to manipulate secrets um, 
is not impossible, but the bar would be very high for accomplishing that kind of snooping. Um, and you'll see later on there's a proposal for us to improve that even further by using TPMs and HSMs more aggressively. Um, but processes that use wallets, this uh, should, and then you see those kind of sub bullets there, use ACLs and principle of least privilege and so forth. Um, this is a general guideline that we want to teach anybody who uses wallets is use them carefully and understand that wallets, because they um, have highly valuable data in them, are a vector for hacking. And um, we will do everything we can in Libindi to protect um, wallets, but uh, uh, having processes use them wisely will also help. So this leads me to this diagram, which is a little bit busy and, and uh, maybe a little bit too colorful, <laughs> but um, I wanted to kind of paint a picture for everybody um, about what kinds of data is appropriate for wallets. Um, what is good wallet data and what is data that really probably doesn't belong in wallets? So um, given all of this background about risk profiles and uh, you know wallets being searchable and wallets needing to be small, so forth, um, if I draw a three-dimensional space where one dimension, the vertical uh, axis here, is how big the data is. <laughs> And the uh, left to right dimension um, is how rich it is, how complex it is inside. Um, and the uh, dimension that's going diagonal down towards the viewer um, is how safe it is to leak the data. Um, if I drew the arrow the other way and called it how sensitive the data is, that, that could work too, but I wanted something that, that went up as it went out. So how safe it is, then the prototypical ideal data to go in a wallet is right near the origin on all three of those dimensions. And that's basically cryptographic keys. They're small, they don't have any internal structure, and they're absolutely not safe to leak. So that's the small green keys um, uh, sphere uh, right in the center. And you can see that as you move away from the origin on any of these dimensions, the data that we're talking about becomes less ideal of a fit for a wallet. And the extreme examples of that, using a wallet as an arbitrary cache for whatever you feel like is a lousy idea. Um, and we should never do that. Um, and so my arbitrary cache circle here is way out it could be quite rich data. Um, it should be pretty safe to leak stuff in, an, in a cache, um, although maybe not perfectly safe. Um, it's probably bigger data than keys. Arbitrary caching is, is a lousy use of a wallet. Let's not do that. Um, a genome is another example for different reasons that, that isn't ideal. Um, genomes are also huge. Um, by the way, another reason that a cache is lousy is that it uh, churns constantly. And I didn't put that as a dimension here because I only had three dimensions and it's hard to draw this diagram. But um, data that's constantly churning is probably not a great uh, kind of data to put in a wallet either. Most You think about keys. Occasionally you might rotate a key, but mostly um, you just write something and then look it up. Um, when you're dealing with keys. Okay, so maybe I've talked this through and beat a dead horse too much. I have heard people talk about putting user preferences in a wallet, and my initial reaction was to say, no, that's not a good idea at all. Um, I've softened a little bit on that. I don't think it's a great use case, but some of your user preferences may actually um, deal with the policies that you want to enforce with agents. Um, or it may deal with um, your posture on certain consent giving and stuff. And so I, I'm, I'm feeling a little bit um, 
less hostile to putting user preferences in a wallet than I used to feel, but I want to acknowledge that that's not very close to the origin on this diagram. Um, so hopefully the, the takeaway is that we re recognize that certain things are good for wallets and other things are not, and let's not abuse wallets, which takes me to this slide. Um, all of us have seen uh, people, maybe some of us have been the people who have a wallet like the one in this picture. You know, it's jam packed with all kinds of crazy stuff. <clears throat> uh, you could buy a wallet and put, and you could fill it up just like the one in this picture, or you could buy a wallet and you could not jam it full of stuff like this. And the manufacturer of the wallet really doesn't have any say over which of those two courses you take. And in the same way, I, I don't think it's going to be possible for us to draw a bright line uh, and say, thou shalt not put the following thing in your wallet. But I hope that the diagram I just showed you sets some expectations and that we recognize that it is possible to use wallets in a way that's pretty un, uh, unoptimal. Um, and so specifically, I'd like people to understand that a wallet is not a general purpose database. Um, there is some searching that's required, some searching features. If we're going to use wallets to prove things about our identity, we have to find those things. And so we've added some features to do that proving and searching. But um, if you say, well, like, let's say that somebody comes uh, in six months to the indie community and says, yeah, I've been... Um, I've been uh, putting all kinds of data in my wallet and now I really want to, here's a hype that I want to raise to add the ability to do joins on data inside of uh, my wallet because I really need that. I, I hope that our general attitude is going to be, no, you don't really need that. You're trying to use a wallet as a general purpose database and you shouldn't. Um, use a general purpose database to solve general purpose database problems. Um, and remember that we listed some personas and some use cases earlier in this presentation. I predict that anybody who comes with such an idea to the community will have strayed from either the personas or the use cases that um, I enumerated. And so that list is meant to provide some reasons why we wouldn't build general purpose database features into wallets. A wallet's not a cache. Uh, I already talked about that a bit. And so um, my last bullet there is just an acknowledgement that with these caveats articulated, we probably can't um, be um, overly prescriptive beyond that. Even if we wanted to be, we don't have any way to enforce that really strongly. So um, let's just um, agree that we will um, promote the idea that you have to use good judgment with wallets and that we're not going to let the design spec for wallets get polluted with um, requirements that are really far afield from its original purpose. Let me stop for just a minute. I've been talking continuously for a long time. Um, is everybody hearing well and um, uh, has have there been any catastrophic questions that I uh, should really address before we go further? You just wanted us to put comments on the slides, or did you want it down in the speaker notes? In the speaker notes. Okay. Okay. So uh, I'll go back to presentation mode here. Time check, we're 40 minutes into our 90 minutes, and I think we're about halfway through our slides. So we're, we're trending to get finished on time, but only barely. <laughs> okay, so um, let's keep going. Okay, tagging and searching. Um, you heard me say earlier that we've realized that we need to be able to search wallets, and so um, tagging is um, the approach that we decided to take that gave the kind of searching we needed uh, to do identity use cases. 
And um, this is something that uh, Darko Kulik, Kulich and um, his team in Belgrade have been working on. And so I'd like to give Darko a chance to talk um, about this feature. Darko, are you in a place where you can speak? Uh, yes, yes, sure. Okay, um, I will um, click through the slides and if you just tell me when um, you want me to go to the next slide, I'll, I'll keep navigating. Okay, thank you, Daniel. Uh, well, regarding the tags, uh, they, uh, every item uh, stored in, in the wallet uh, may have arbitrary number of, of tags. So uh, they, they could be seen as uh, additional data attached to the, to the item. So either some kind of descriptors or something like that. And uh, the main purpose of uh, tagging is to enable uh, easy and efficient searching. Uh, for credentials and uh, similar uh, data, you may uh, easily see the the reason why we, you need uh, to find uh, one credential out of a few thousand of them or something that, uh, more even. And uh, when we talked about this, we, we noticed that uh, if we encrypt uh, the tag names and tag values, uh, we could only search for uh, equal, not equal, and uh, for in operator, which is actually a more efficient uh, writing of uh, equal. And uh, uh, sometimes you want to search for uh, greater than, greater than, equal, less than, less than, equal, or even like. Uh, so uh, the idea there is to uh, allow uh, some tags not to be encrypted at all. Uh, only tag values, tag names are always encrypted. Just to explain, and the uh, uh, user of the wallet must uh, explicitly choose to, uh, not to encrypt that value. This is done by uh, prepending the tilde character to the tag name, and uh, it is recommended to do that only if uh, uh, such uh, such uh, functionality is uh, needed, and the uh, data which is exposed that way is uh, not uh, very secret. So, yeah, uh, um, let me just uh, chime in and say um, we wanted to make it so that uh, unencrypted tags could be used, but we don't think that's a co super common or that most tags will be unencrypted. And we want to force somebody to make an explicit decision to go unencrypted. So you kind of have to go out of your way to um, have a tag be unencrypted. Um, but it you you can do it, and there might be some reasons for particular kinds of data um, that that would make sense. Daniel, we missed the last uh, twenty seconds of what you said. All right, let's let's go on anyway. I I don't want to slow down the flow. Um, are you ready to go to the next slide, Darko? Yes, please. Okay, so who may search for the credentials? Uh, individuals may, may search for a credential which would satisfy proof request. Uh, they may search for a credential from given issuer or some issuer type like a, a driver's license or something like that uh, to find which credentials are expiring uh, so they can re renew that. And also organizations have their, their own reasons for uh, searching uh, uh, they are able to search by uh, many properties, so uh, it's up to them to to find uh, their use, use case. Uh, you may find a uh, few, few reasons here uh, written. Um, that's great. Uh, perhaps we could turn the microphone to Slava for just a minute, if he's available to talk about the uh, wallet query language. Yeah, yeah. Actually, uh, before uh, we go to wallet query language, one note. Uh, uh, actually, um, search is useful not only to search credential. For example, we also use search uh, uh, to search non-secret stores in the wallet, and uh, user can define tags, and uh, it's already available as public API in Libindia. So, and just small note. Uh, to perform search, uh, we define it a simple query language that we call WQL. 
Um, this language allows complex searching of wallet uh, and storage records based on uh, tags. Um, actually, it is only search uh, language, so no any updates support. Also, we don't support any joins here. So um, this query language is based on JSON. So main reason is to avoid of implementation of uh, custom syntax parsers. Uh, language has very simple grammar and um, actually lexical parser is uh, uh, easy to implement and uh, grammar is very similar to MongoDB query language and uh, this language actually is familiar to a lot of developers and we hope it uh, uh, will be easy to learn. Uh, we can move to the next slide. Yeah, uh, here you can find uh, formal grammar for the language. Actually, it's quite short. And uh, uh, we can just, uh, I believe, go to the next slide and look to the few examples of search. Uh, so, uh, in the slides, you can just find uh, example of query. Uh, with uh, uh, this query, we try to find credential where a subject so is like ACME and uh, issue date is critters uh, uh, and last week. So, actually, uh, say uh, two subqueries. First one is defines predicate on subject field, and uh, a next subquery defines predicate on issue date and uh, uh, we compose uh, this predicate to one query uh, with actually end. Yeah, uh, and let me just uh, make a note. Um, the thing that we say query colon and then you see uh, the curly brace to begin a block of JSON, that block of JSON is what you would pass to as the query parameter in a particular function in libindy. Um, Right, uh, Slava? Uh, actually, it depends. Uh, if, uh, for example, you search a credential that satisfies uh, proof request, uh, Limbindi will create this query automatically to satisfy uh, proof request. And uh, say in point that consumes this query uh, as public API, for example, in non-secrets. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Okay, um, and then let's look at another example real quick. Yeah, actually, uh, it's similar to previous one, uh, but use different predicates. And uh, uh, for example, here is a query that allow to get all credentials about me, uh, very schema in uh, some subset of uh, uh, schemas and uh, issuer ID in subset of uh, issuer IDs. Okay, um, I think um, you could probably learn um, that whole query language in about three minutes as a programmer. If you just stare at the screen, you basically could get very confident uh, very quickly in how to do that. We didn't want to invent something big and complicated, and I, I feel pretty pleased with what came out there. Thank you, Slava, for leading the uh, design on that query language. Yeah. You're welcome. <laughs> we can, I believe, go next. Okay, so um, uh, we mentioned earlier in the presentation that um, encryption is now done by uh, libindy across the board. Um, it, it imposes an encryption barrier, basically, so that the storage only ever sees encrypted data. Um, and uh, you can, as a consumer of libindy, um, deal in plain text for many things. For example, your queries that you're feeding in can be fed in as plain text, and then libindy will, um, you know, automatically modify the query that you're giving such that it is compatible with the encryption that the persist persistence layer sees. So let's talk a little bit about how that encryption actually works. And for this, I'd like uh, Darko to be the um, narrator. Oh, okay, if, if you think about uh, uh, all of fields which, which are present in the wallet, 
uh, we figure out we need a few types of, uh, of encryption or ways of encrypting the data. So first is a uh, searchable first. These are these are fields uh, which may be searched for, and uh, for them uh, they are encrypted with the same uh, cipher. Uh, the only difference is uh, which key is used and uh, which initialization vector is used. So for searchable fields. Uh, uh, those fields are encrypted with their own keys, or so every uh, column, let's say, uh, have its own key. And uh, because uh, we need uh, for, for the same input to, to produce the same output, so we can search, search for the data, initialization vector is a HMAC uh, a value of the field being, being encrypted. So uh, for HMAC, you of course use another key. So by using that, uh, we have predictive uh, output of the encryption, so we can uh, search on match uh, data. Such fields are type ID, tag name, and tag value. Uh, value is another type of, of encryption. Value is encrypted uh, differently because uh, uh, it's assumed that value is uh, um, more secret data yeah, inside of the wallet. So the value is encrypted with its dedicated key. Uh, for every value, value uh, new value key is generated. Uh, that key is uh, encrypted by a uh, column key and saved in, uh, in, inside of, of the storage. Uh, and uh, value is encrypted with that new, newly generated key. Uh, uh, both encryption are, are done with the uh, 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 initialization vector, which, which is random. Uh, that way, it, we feel that value is uh, much harder to break the encryption there than other data. And uh, we have also one, uh, items in the database which are wallet keys. So uh, uh, data inside the wallet is not encrypted by master key, but uh, by special, special uh, wallet keys. There are seven of them. And these uh, keys are all stored in the metadata, of course, encrypted with master keys. So by opening wallet, we are essentially decrypting these uh, wallet keys. So uh, you can uh, encrypt and encrypt data uh, inside or out of the of wallet. Uh, maybe, maybe get next slide. Okay, before you go to the next slide, let me just make a comment. Um, mm -hmm. For many of people in the audience, um, you might have had your eyes glaze over a little bit um, as Darko was talking. If you're a little bit like me, it's hard for you to get your brain to um, follow the details of initialization vectors and stuff like that. Um, the, the key thing I think you should take away from this slide if you're working at a higher level is there's a very sophisticated encryption uh, process going on and it's much more granular than just encrypting everything in the wallet with the same key. Um, we needed it to be the case that you could change the keys that protect the wallet without having to re-encrypt gigabytes of data. And um, we also needed to be able to hide certain patterns in encrypted data, but to find other kinds of patterns. And so um, that's why the detail that Darko just talked through is important and relevant. And um, even if you don't know all the detail, um, if you can kind of remember those general uh, things that I said, uh, it will be good stuff to know. So let's go on to the next slide. Okay, next slide is again talking about uh, details of this encryption and uh, uh, we use a cha cha 20 poly 1305 uh, ES cipher. It is planned in the future maybe to support uh, multiple ciphers. So when you create quality, you, you may choose one, but currently only this one is supported. Uh, like I said, every field is encrypted with its own encrypt uh, column key, and uh, two more keys are needed for HMAC. Uh, and uh, uh, I wouldn't bother too much with, with this if uh, if you are not interested in. But let us say that uh, seven column keys. These seven column keys are concatenated and encrypted with master key and saved into metadata of the wallet. Uh, uh, this allow efficient uh, rotation of master key because uh, if, if you want to change uh, your master key, you would just uh, decrypt this key. Th these keys encrypt them uh, again with new master key and uh, just save, save it back. So uh, 
from that time, uh, new master key is used to open the wall. Okay, may go. Uh, this is a schematic how this field exists and uh, how they encrypted. It, it is essentially the, the talk we already uh, have had, but uh, just in uh, in one place uh, with the details. And uh, in next slide. Um, before you go to the next slide, let me just explain um, the notation here a little bit. Mm -hmm. So um, you have four rectangles, and each one represents a table in a relational database. Um, now, um, not every uh, storage um, is going to have tables and relational database mechanisms, but even if they don't, um, you could think about the way the data is organized as if it were tables and stuff. So um, uh, imagine that you have a table called encrypted tags, a table called unencrypted tags, and so forth, and then an items table that um, uh, the tags describe. So you have an item that could have one or more um, tags and unencrypted tags and stuff like that. Um, and what this is showing is field names for those tables. So the two fields in the encrypted tags table are tag name and tag value. And the four fields in the items table are type name, value, and value key. And then what it's showing is how that particular field is encrypted. And so, um, for example, uh, the value field in the items table is encrypted by running a cha-cha-20 poly-1305 uh, cipher against uh, a random initialization vector um, where the data to be encrypted is the value and the key to be used is the value key. And so um, I know that that's super technical, but if you want to parse this diagram in more detail, that's how to understand it. Yes, this diagram provides data, uh, which key is used for, for which data and uh, so on. Uh, so if you want to see, you may look here. And uh, this is just an example of how this data would look inside of some database. It, it is a, uh, some SQL implementation. It, it doesn't need to be that way, but this is just an example. So we have a table items with uh, three uh, items inside it. There are possibly more of them, but uh, just an example so you can see uh, which column or which field uh, holds uh, which data. So for credential type would be something like credential. Uh, it, would, it would have some name, which is probably some idea of the, that credential. Value will be some JSON, which is uh, all created. And value key will be some random key, which is used to complete the, the value. So for that uh, item, you may have a, a tax uh, schema ID, issuer ID, and maybe some plain text. Uh, I choose a type. Uh, it, it is not a great, great uh, uh, tag uh, for plain text, but uh, just to show how uh, plain text tags are uh, uh, placed into database and that value of the plain text tag is. Uh, like the name says, uh, plain text, it's not encrypted at all. So some attacker uh, who breaks into the, uh, the state. Yes. Um, I hope everybody gets a sense that there's a lot of depth behind this particular topic um, and that there's significant value that Indy is adding to the wallet layer by doing this encryption on behalf of uh, programmers so that they don't need to worry about this, but they can be confident that the data is highly secure. Um, so let's talk about pluggable storage now. How would you actually write a particular storage backend? Let's say you're a programmer that works for a, an organization that loves Oracle databases and your org says, well, we want all of our wallet data to be stored in Oracle. Uh, you could uh, very cheerfully nod your head and say, yeah, no problem. And uh, you would be able to implement um, a pluggable storage that's Oracle based for your organization. 
Now we expect that in many cases you won't have to implement your own pluggable storage because there will be one available um, that satisfies your needs. But if you did need to implement one, um, let's talk a little bit about what you have to implement. And uh, I think this is a topic where Slava would be a good spokesman. Slava, are you available to talk about this? Yeah. As we already said, uh, storage uh, is a very important part of plugin. Actually, Libindi provides um, uh, out of the box a default storage that is based on uh, SQLite. Uh, and also Libindi provides interface uh, that allows um, uh, to plug different storage implementation and uh, this plugin will allow to store wallet records in a place suitable for application. It can be file, it can be relational database, MySQL, Oracle, or maybe MongoDB if some organization or use case want uh, this. Um, uh, very important is that storage plugin is responsible only for storage and don't know anything about crypto. Actually, storage uh, provides an interface that's very similar to k-value database. And uh, Libindi provides an uh, endpoint that called register plugin storage that consumes a uh, set of C functions uh, uh, that plugin should implement. And uh, this set of functions just defines the, this uh, k-value storage interface. Uh, usually, each plugin that implements uh, this storage uh, uh, implements uh, these uh, C handlers, and but these C handlers usually private and not exposed. Instead of this, uh, plugin exposes uh, some init function uh, that don't require any params, and uh, this function. Uh, internally calls uh, libindi register plugin storage endpoint. And uh, when application want to use uh, some storage, for example, uh, to store the data in MySQL, it just uh, links dynamically or statically with storage plugin and calls uh, uh, plugin init function in the beginning of uh, uh, application main function. And um, uh, exactly the same way Indy CLI uses uh, to work with pluggable storage. Uh, for current moment, uh, I'm not sure that we completely support this because uh, uh, we don't uh, provide uh, custom options uh, to our when we create our wallets. Uh, but uh, Indy CLI allows to uh, have has command load plugin. And uh, user can just call this load plugin command and uh, provide the path to uh, dynamic library with uh, uh, storage plugin and CLI will load this plugin and call init function. And as a result, we can just use uh, CLI with different storages. Actually, exactly the same approach is used uh, to load uh, payments plugins. Yeah, so um, I hope everybody understands the significance of that last item. What that means is you can take the Indy CLI and you can use it with a wallet that uh, uses your Oracle uh, plugin, you know, storage plugin back end. And we haven't had to modify the CLI to support Oracle. It just automatically works um, if, if you've written your storage plugin correctly. So that's the goal is that you could do operations using whatever kind of uh, storage uh, you want uh, for a wallet in the CLI. Yeah, we can uh, go to the next slide. Uh, there is the interface uh, that uh, storage should implement. Actually, say is a create uh, callback, delete handler, open handler, close handler. Uh, they are related to creation of uh, uh, storage or database or and uh, say the calls to add uh, record and to delete record exactly the same we can uh, get record by id and we can update record value update record tax uh, add additional record tax uh, remove for record tax and uh, very important uh, call is uh, search records uh, this call consumes uh, 
uh, WQL query and return search handle and says some additional end, uh, handlers uh, that will uh, provide uh, iterator like uh, uh, interface over the search handle. Also, uh, storage should uh, provide iterator over all records stored uh, inside of storage. This iterator is needed uh, because uh, we need to have ability to import and export data. And uh, also storage support uh, uh, storing some uh, metadata. Uh, for example, uh, uh, encrypted uh, uh, keys for encryption can be stored as part of this metadata. Yeah, um, I'd, I'd like to just um, comment. Um, I, I'm super happy with this. I, I hope that um, uh, you, Slava, and Darko are happy too. I feel like we've done a very good thing here. Um, I was having a conversation with Jason yesterday, um, and we were talking about how many functions there are in libindy. And um, I, I said, uh, I came up with a number that I guessed were the, the, was the count of the public functions. The list that's here is not public functions. These are functions that only uh, happen, let me go back in my diagram to, um, or in my slides to the, let's see, where's my diagram? This one, okay. This uh, arrow right here um, between the core of a wallet and the pluggable storage is, uh, as you can see, not consumed by the outside world. It's rather an interface between the wallet core and the pluggable storage, and it's a private interface. So um, the set of functions that we're looking at right here is not a set that um, the average uh, programmer has to worry about. But if you're writing new pluggable storage, these are the functions you have to implement. Yeah, yeah. Um, Darko, do you want to talk about import-export, AKA <laughs> backup and restore? Uh, yes, if you think about it, they are the, the same uh, programmatically. Uh, we need import export uh, to avoid locking of customer for a specific agency or, or, or device uh, because user uh, would need to change their phones or if they are unhappy with the uh, agency provider, they may choose uh, another company. And uh, because of that, we, we would need uh, ex export which is uh, compatible with uh, all uh, uh, in the wallets. So uh, because of that, export import is important issues to be inside of the Indy. And uh, like uh, Daniel said, it is used for backup and restore. Uh, it is encrypted with a different key. It is not the same uh, master key used for uh, opening wallets. So you uh, define the key for, uh, for export. Uh, it will contain a whole wallet data. Uh, this is a different uh, because we'll get you, you, you may not get uh, all secrets. Exports will contain even secrets uh, because you need to move them. Uh, idea is to be done in a streaming way. So uh, even if you have very big wallet, uh, you, you may export it on, on your phone or, or, or similar because uh, it's, it's not important how much uh, RAM memory you have because uh, it will uh, do one record at, at the time. Uh, Import is uh, possible only on new wallets, so because of that, uh, every import will create wallet. So it's not uh, possible currently to import uh, inside of uh, existing wallet. Uh, some possible future uh, enhancements are uh, compression. It must be done before encryption because uh, encrypted data compressed poorly. Uh, some selective backup, selective resource, incremental backup. Uh, and uh, of course, to support uh, different ciphers, currently it, it is used the same uh, cipher, Tata uh, 20, uh, 1305. Yeah, um, and I didn't put, or we didn't, we didn't put this on the list of possible future enhancements, but you could imagine um, this last bullet item, uh, you could possibly have an enhancement that would allow us to import into an existing wallet, but that of course complicates the um, import uh, tremendously because then you have to answer questions like, well, what happens if you have an existing value for the same thing? 
uh, which one wins and stuff like that. So could be done in the future, but not done right now. Yes, no, it's only basing, uh, basic export import support. So um, uh, let me just mention briefly, we said at the beginning of this presentation that um, uh, identity wallets um, are somewhat like cryptocurrency wallets. And um, right now, um, I don't know that there's, um, you know, things you can point to in the wallet interface that are explicitly cryptocurrency handling features or whatever. But um, what we would imagine is that cryptocurrency keys are just like any other secret. And so you could put um, cryptocurrency keys into a wallet. Um, we have said that uh, our wallet today is very opinionated about where secrets get created. You don't put Ebola into something. You, you, start its entire life in an isolated place. And so um, if we want to maintain that, then um, people who already have keys to payment addresses in Bitcoin or whatever would, would not have a way to keep the existing keys. You'd have to rotate your keys as you transferred control of that kind of a thing into an indie wallet. Um, so that's why there's a question mark on the middle bullet there. Um, and uh, we don't, there are cryptocurrency wallets today that have features around doing money transfers and performing payments or whatever. And right now um, our vision is that um, we would provide APIs that would let um, cri cryptocurrency keys be used, but we probably wouldn't build a lot of like payment oriented features into indie wallets. So um, that's probably as much detail as we need to go into on payments right now. Um, so let's talk briefly about things that could be done with wallets in the future. Um, we know that um, part of where we're headed in the future is with is micro ledgers. And uh, there's, if you haven't run into the concept of micro ledgers, the bullets here kind of describe what micro ledgers are. The little call out in the top right corner talks about how this relates to wallets. Um, both micro ledgers and wallets have to store DIDs and public keys. And in that sense, they may have a little bit of overlap. And so as we start to do work on micro ledgers, we may need to um, clarify a little bit um, for the community. How do you know what goes in a wallet versus a micro ledger? And, and um, how do you make all that happen correctly? So I imagine that's something on our future wallet to-do list. Um, we need to use secure enclaves of various kinds better. And um, this concept is the concept of wrapping a secret in the secure enclave. So you have a particular piece of information that you, it's maybe it's, too big to store in the secure enclave or you have too many things like this that you need to st store to put them all in the secure enclave. You could leave the secret on disk, but you could wrap the secret with a wrapping key that is inside the secure enclave. And this would um, give you uh, a nice benefit in that um, if you ever pulled the, uh, uh, let's say pulled the hard drive that contained the secret out of a machine and took it somewhere else. Um, you could try uh, really hard to crack the secret, but without the secure enclave um, being open to you, you really have little hope of doing that. Um, and the actual key that uh, encrypts a wallet um, might be an interesting thing to use uh, with a secure enclave wrapping. Um, there's some other things that might be good candidates for this. We haven't done a lot of work on this yet and um, our thinking is not mature enough to um, formalize in this proposal, but I'm giving you a preview that we need to do something related to this probably. Um, and we may end up, when we do this feature, we may end up writing a few functions that we expose through the wallet interface that lets you interact with secure enclaves in useful ways. Um, as 
Darko mentioned earlier, we're imagining that there will be pluggable ciphers so that somebody who has a need for FIPS compliance, for example, could pick a government approved uh, cipher to use with their wallet. Um, and an in another interesting use case is to have a null cipher uh, plugged in. Um, null ciphers would do no actual encryption and why you would want to do that is um, if you were a programmer and you were developing something and you wanted to observe um, what happened um, uh, without having encryption muddy the waters. Um, so that could be useful. Um, and um, <laughs> my bottom bullet there has a typo in it. Should we use a single cipher to import export? Um, this is a question about whether we want to allow pluggable ciphers um, with import export or we want to say, well, when you save things for import export, you want you always want to use this cipher. We strongly encourage it anyway because it's the most interoperable one. I, that's an unresolved question. Probably we need some flexibility, but it's just worth thinking about. Um, uh, a note about replication, which is something in our future. It's clear that we have to replicate some data from wallets, uh, from one agent to another. So um, the DIDs that you know about on your, uh, uh, your iPhone and, the, and on your tablet and on your laptop, probably that set of DIDs is identical or nearly identical. Um, but the agent specific keys, the keys that your iPhone uses to sign things, don't, you shouldn't replicate to your uh, tablet. Uh, you could replicate the public key, but not the private key secret um, associated with it. And so um, replication is a little bit more complicated with wallets than it is with just general data replication. And uh, we see this as a feature that uh, we need to be working on in the future. Um, and then the notion that external data needs to somehow be associated with a wallet. If you remember back to my three-dimensional diagram, I said that genomes don't belong in a wallet. But genomes might need to be tracked by a wallet because they might, if, if a wallet is tracking things like the consent that you give and the credentials that you use to prove stuff, it may be uh, pretty relevant to a particular kind of interaction you're having with your self-sovereign identity. Um, so when data is too big to go in a wallet, it's too remote, meaning it's not actually on the specific device where the wallet is. Um, it's too different from wallet data in other ways, uh, like the usage and access patterns. Um, and it's owned by code that knows nothing about wallets and doesn't care and will never be updated uh, to be wallet aware. Then you can't store that data directly in a wallet. However, you still might want to make that data findable when you search uh, for stuff. You still might want to enforce tamper evidence on that data. Um, and you still might have metadata about it that you want to encrypt. And you still might want to know about it when you're backing things up. So what we could do is have uh, a construct of external data that's incorporated by reference only inside of a wallet. Um, and this would allow a wallet to um, make the data queryable and uh, let you add metadata, but not actually manage the bits of the specific files. Um, last thing I think on the future work, um, Ian I think is on this call and introduced a concept that he called virtual wallets um, in some of his work. And I think that's a really interesting uh, concept. Um, and I have some uh, some questions that I think we ought to tackle as we bring that concept to the community. Um, uh, for Ian, I believe, Ian, tell me if I'm right about this, the virtual wallet was basically a way to, you know, impose a view on the larger wallet where you're basically saying, I just want to think about all the credentials that relate to subject one and not subject two. Is that a fair summary? 
Yeah, that's right. So in our wallet, we're storing credentials for uh, different corporations. So for us, uh, when we're doing a query, we want a query by corporation. So that's that's uh, basically the top level of a virtual wallet for us is specific to a corporation. Yeah. Also, we're thinking that eventually as the corporations adopt the technology, they'll each have their own wallet. So the, the contents of their own wallet, um, if they're adopting the technology and they want to you know, kind of take on ownership of their own credentials, then the, the contents of their own corporate wallet would equate to what we're calling their virtual wallet in the workbook. Okay. Yeah, so some of the questions that I think we ought to uh, explore as we mature this concept are, um, what if, you have data that isn't credentials in your wallet. Um, does the virtual view that you try to activate, um, does it also filter down that data as well? Um, and also, how does this relate to the concept of guardianship? If you're a parent and you are acting as a guardian for your child, do you have a virtual wallet um, that relates to your child or should you just have a separate wallet for your child so that you can't mix things you can't accidentally act as a child when you should be acting as yourself or you know that kind of a thing um, I, I think this is a really cool concept that we need to think about but I'm separating it from my particular hype and I'm thinking a, a separate hype will be raised to talk about this particular issue um, so, oh, I think this is the last one um, that I wanted to mention as future work. Today, wallets are associated with a specific pool or specific ledger. So we say this is a wallet and this is the pool I'm talking to. Um, but um, I, we need to remove that association. It should be possible for a single wallet to contain DID and key material stuff for multiple ledgers. Um, uh, so the same uh, self-sovereign identity could have take some actions on the sovereign test network and some actions on the sovereign live network, not with the same DID, but using the same wallet that contains DIDs that belong in one or belong in the other. So um, there's already tickets in um, the Indy backlog, uh, the Indy SDK backlog to implement fully qualified DIDs instead of um, rel uh, relative DIDs that assume a particular pool. And so once we have that in um, our wallets, then um, we should remove the um, API parameters that ask us to specify which ledger we're dealing with when we open a wallet. Um, so this is really a warning about future deprecation, I think. Um, and you can see the link to the ticket there in JIRA. So this is the last slide that I wanted to cover and we're mostly out of time. Um, I, we can go back and look at speaker notes that have accumulated, or I mean questions that have accumulated in speaker notes. I'm gonna start doing that, but if anybody is urgently raising their hand and says, me, me, please pick me, I have a burning question, um, start talking while I'm looking through uh, to see if there's speaker note questions. Hey, Daniel. Yeah. I always have a Bernie question. Steve Cohen here. Um, <laughs> um, just wondering if the searching capability um, is, is triggerable from the proof request. So is the proof request format being changed at all such that the, um, the verifier that is issuing a proof request can put in some information such that they can't, that, that it triggers the searching. So um, the short answer to that is not yet, but that is our intention. Um, okay. Thank you. The, we, we absolutely want that. Um, there's some work going on um, on an initiative called ZK Lang. I think you may have heard of that before. I, and, I have heard of that. Yeah. Yeah, so the intention is to kind of glue these three or four different um, topics together such that the new um, search capabilities inside of a wallet can be efficiently used when you um, look at a proof request and generate something called a proof resolution, 
the proof resolution tells, it's kind of like a query plan in a relational database. It tells how you're going to map uh, something to specific credentials and so forth. And um, generating that efficiently will take advantage of the query capabilities. And um, so it should be possible, the, the verifier doesn't have to know wallet query language and doesn't have to think about, doesn't have to know what kind of credentials exist, but expresses an intention. And uh, on the other side, the prover um, uh, passes that down along with some guidance and resolution happens uh, using efficient queries. Yeah, sounds good. Okay, Mike uh, Lauder has a comment on the security consideration slide. Check that we really are uh, erasing memory. Um, okay, that's a good to-do item. Not a question, but thank you, Mike. We'll follow up on that. Um, not seeing a lot of other questions accumulating here. So, uh, Stephen, uh, I think this might be Stephen Felt instead of Stephen Curran. Um, I assume the encrypted column keys are stored in the wallet DB. Yes, uh, the encrypted column keys are stored. They're, the, they're one of the seven keys in this bottom paragraph here. Where is metadata stored? Metadata is also something that's stored in a wallet. Um, although there's, of course, metadata upon layer upon layer of metadata. So there's certainly metadata outside of wallets, but there's a kind of metadata that's stored in wallets. I think that's the kind you're talking about. Are there plans for moving, migrating, sharing wallets between devices? Yes, the, that's the, um, well, okay. For um, the, the import export would allow you to address a situation where you don't like your agency, uh, you wanna get rid of it, so you go to somewhere else. That's a form of moving uh, a wallet from one device to another. And some of the wallet data that you would move would need to be recreated because you'd need new keys in your new location. Um, but other pieces of data, like all of the um, public keys of the parties that you have um, uh, relationships with and stuff like that, you would want to migrate. So um, migration is a complex topic, but yes, there are some plans uh, to work on that. Uh, let's see if there's any other. Stephen Curran, incremental vote. So you're plus one on the vote for incremental. Um, okay, um, we, we don't have any deep designs on incremental yet. We're just acknowledging the fact that incremental is probably an interesting desire. So we'll have to work on that probably as a separate uh, feature, but I, I'm uh, in harmony with your comment there, Stephen. Let's see. Okay, so that's kind of the end of the comments and it's the end of the, our time too. Thank you everybody for coming. Um, we will uh, share this recording uh, and the slide deck remains shared with everybody. If you wanna look up the slide deck again, I'll just leave you with the uh, bit.ly link to it. And there will be a formal hype raised that embodies these ideas in greater detail uh, shortly. And uh, I encourage you to share uh, this knowledge with others. Uh, and uh, remember, this is a hype, which means the P in it means it's a proposal. So um, if you need to steer the proposal, please do so. And uh, thank you for coming. We will talk to you later.